much. It, it's a great honor for me to talk about dynamic MRI. Um, this is something that I've um, been very, very interested in. And I think with there's been a lot of talk about sagittal balance for the cervical and the thoracic and lumbar spine. And I think we understand the importance of position, uh, especially when we're assessing our patients. And I think there's nowhere that's more, so much more important than when we're doing these MRI studies. Uh, these are my disclosures. There's nothing to do with any dynamic MRI. But these are the, um, the five areas that I'd like to discuss today in my time. First, what is dynamic MRI? Because there's a lot of different terms you might have heard. Kinetic MRI, positional MRI, upright MRI. At least in the United States, these are all terms, or they call them flexion extension MRI. These are all terms that have been used to describe sort of an upright MRI. Um, but basically what it is is that when we have a standard MRI, the patient is lying down. And obviously when the patient's lying down, you get a good picture of the spine, but it's not physiologically loaded. It's not in the position of pain. Uh, when you get the patient upright, um, you can actually load the spine. You can see pathology that you may not see when the patient is lying down. And the other thing is that you can actually put the patient in a, in a position. There, there are often times where we have patients and they say, well, it only hurts when I do this. And they, get, they put themselves in a position. And oftentimes, you can actually put them in that position uh, when you're doing the MRI study. Um, and so we can get fairly sophisticated. Um, obviously, if a patient is, is heavy, these are open MRIs. So they might be a little bit more comfortable, especially if the patient is claustrophobic. Uh, for children, it's a little bit more palatable for them because they can sit on their parent's lap as they do it. Um, and obviously there are patients that have severe deformities where they're not comfortable sitting or lying down for a standard MRI. And so these patients, it would be very hard to get them in a, in a normal MRI. They may not fit and they may have so much pain when they're lying down that they may, not, they may be too much uh, movement. And we also know that position matters, um, not just in the spine, but also in other areas. And so I do think this, this technology applies throughout all of the musculoskeletal system. And we might be seeing this, obviously, for the shoulder, the knee, the foot, the ankle, for other areas. Um, we always look at it as a very powerful research tool because this allows us to do fairly sophisticated and accurate measurements of the structures of the spine. And we'll talk a little bit about that later. Now, how does, does this apply to the spine? Well, I think we all understand how this is valuable to the spine. We have these great regular images, uh, but we know that the spine is moving, especially as we go to newer technologies where we're trying to preserve motion. Perhaps dynamic MRI in different positions is the best way to assess these patients. If we're doing cervical arthroplasty or lumbar arthroplasty or any type of motion preservation device. And then we all have these patients where we ask ourselves these questions. So uh, for this question, you know, is there instability? If we presented this case at any conference, you could argue, well, I'll do just a decompression, or I have to do a fusion. Uh, what about the adjacent segment? Um, is there some pathology that I'm missing? We would probably argue, do we do L4-5 here, or do we include L5-S1? Now, I'm not saying the dynamic MRI will give you all the answers, but I think dynamic MRI can help us answer some of these questions as we're treating this patient. Now, these are some case studies. Now, obviously, some of this you would pick up on flexion extension views. So if you look at this, this is a hypermobile spine. The nice thing about this with the MRI is I can actually see the structures that are causing the nerve impingement. I can see where the instability is with the dynamic MRI. I would see the instability with flexion extension x-rays. I could infer the amount of neurologic stenosis by looking at a regular MRI and looking at the open facets. But with doing the dynamic MRI, we're going to be able to really see which structures are causing the problem in case we're going to miss something. Again, another example, I would pick this up on flexion extension x-rays. So just seeing the instability, I could see that on normal x-rays. But here I can see the, about the, what happens to the disc, what happens to the facet joints. And you might not find anything new that you could not imply from a normal MRI, but sometimes you can surprise yourself. Here's a patient that has uh, radiculopathy, and on the left side, there's the recumbent MRI, and there is a disc herniation, and there is some compression of that nerve. But obviously, the magnitude of this disc herniation gets a little bit more impressive when the patient is upright and loading. 
And again, this might not be in a position of flexion extension, just loading the spine, you might see this pathology. But doing flexion extension imaging can actually give you a better understanding of the biomechanics of the spine. Um, artificial discs, for those of people that are doing artificial discs for the lumbar spine, you can maybe pick up some facet stenosis or facet foraminal stenosis that might make you question whether or not this patient is a, a good candidate for a disc um, replacement. Um, we're not using as much interspinous spacers, but we always wonder what happens to the disc when we put a, an interspinous spacer in? Are we flexing the spine? And this is, I don't have the movie attached to this, um, to this uh, slide, but this is an example of a patient when they flex, the, the, the disc gets bigger, and so this might not be a great candidate for an interspinous spacer and in changing the position of the spine. This is a patient, the normal MRI recumbent shows some disc bulges, but nothing that impressive. But when they get upright, there's a much more impressive disc herniation. If you look at the axial cuts, on the left is the normal MRI. This is a patient post-op from a discectomy. I don't see that much compression on the left side. You get that patient up, you can see that there's a more impressive disc herniation there. So arguably, this is a patient that had a discectomy, has ongoing radicular pain. If you had the normal MRI, you might sit there and say, I'm not sure you're a surgical candidate. You've already had your decompression. If you still have symptoms, it could just be nerve damage. Maybe you, your nerve just hasn't recovered. But if you get the upright MRI, it's changed that patient into a patient that now you see some pathology. And now you say, well, maybe there's something I can do for this patient surgically. Um, and, and so I think it can make a difference clinically in certain positions. Sometimes it doesn't make any difference. This is a patient, recumbent MRI on the left, standing flexion on the right. Um, it shows the discs might be a little different, but it, it doesn't give you that much more information. So I don't think we need to do this on everyone. But here's a patient where there is impressive disc herniations at three levels, whereas on the flexion view, there's no, there's no really compression. There might be some congenital stenosis. And so this is the patient where if they had a disc herniation, they may be more likely to get adjacent segment disease if you do a surgery at one level. Because obviously we've found pathology in three levels. It doesn't mean you have to operate on all of this. Obviously that's a clinical decision, but I think the dynamic MRI gives us a little bit more information about those segments so that if you were to operate at one or two of these segments, you could at least warn the patient that they might have adjacent segment problems. Now, this is kind of a, a similar case. On the recumbent MRI, if this patient has radiculopathy or myelopathy, you might say, well, there's a, there's a little congenital stenosis on the left side. There's not a huge disc herniation. But you get that patient upright in extension, and you can see that there are three levels of disc bulging. Now, it may not change what you do. Uh, you would probably still localize their symptoms and, and do the surgery if it was appropriate based on their clinical presentation. Say this patient had radiculopathy um, at, let's see, two, three, four, five, at C5, six, what would you do about this level that's circled, C4, five? And, and would you, if you were gonna treat C5, six, would you still treat four, five? On that recumbent MRI, I don't think I would, right? But on the upright extension MRI, I'd be worried about that C4, five segment. And if I didn't treat that patient at that segment, I might warn them more about adjacent segment disease. This is that cross-sectional cut at that same level. Again, recumbent MRI, C4-5 on the left side, not that impressive, but it's a little bit more impressive with the upright extension. And so arguably, this, this increase in that disc herniation at C4-5, again, if they had symptoms and it was appropriate, you might ch it might change your cervical plan. Here's a patient. Um, I don't think these are that comparable. Um, I think the one on the right is a little bit more in the midline. But uh, there's an example of a patient having a fairly large disc herniation at one level, and then you're seeing a, a different um, extension uh, MRI on the right side showing pathology at the adjacent segment, which is a little bit more impressive. This is actually a case that was sent to me by one of my colleagues in Argentina. This patient had myelopathy, there's cervical stenosis, and they did a corpectomy. This patient did not get completely better. And what they found is, is when they did a, an MRI in different positions, this is from Argentina. It's not an upright MRI. It's a normal MRI done in different positions. What they thought is, is that there's some residual stenosis at that adjacent segment that they didn't pick up. And so they basically used the MRI to guide them in fusing this patient. And they were able to fuse the patient in a position where that disc was not pushing backwards. And this patient actually recovered quite well. And so 
Arguably, if he had done a positional upright MRI, maybe you would have seen this pathology before the first surgery, and maybe it would have changed what you did at the initial surgery, but at least they felt that a positional MRI without loading it, so this was a supine MRI with them in the neck in different positions, this allowed them to see some pathology at the adjacent segment that they didn't see in, in the um, initial. Here's a patient, um, again, different views of the MRI showing the pathology a little bit different de depending on the position. And so again, we are seeing pathology in different positions. And this is a patient on the left side, status post, I think a laminoplasty or laminectomy infusion, um, cord signal changes, didn't recover all the way, and you get the uh, upright MRI and you see that there might be some residual stenosis here. Again, taking a patient that had a surgery um, that you might evaluate with a normal MRI and say this is not a surgical candidate, getting the upright MRI may allow you to do something for this patient. As far as research, I'm about to, um, I think that not everyone needs a dynamic MRI, but it has helped in certain position, in, in certain situations. I look at it as a powerful research tool because we can do measurements, we can get the patient in different positions, and we can measure everything. And we can see the disc, we can grade the discs. Now, I'm gonna run through about 10 slides on studies. You're not gonna understand it. The, the goal here is not to explain every single study, but just to give you an idea of the amount of research we can do on this patient uh, on, using this technology. We can measure, we can look at the disc, we can look at the amount of stenosis. We have published probably 50 or 60 articles on dynamic MRI, and there's so much more that can be done. Very powerful research tool. There are a lot of studies showing that you miss pathology, but then there are a lot of studies just showing how we can use this as a research tool. We can understand how the disks change, how people degenerate. We, we have a huge database of you know, tens of thousands of patients that have had these MRIs. We can look at what happens at C5-6 when there's degeneration and there's no movement. What happens to the translational motion at the adjacent segments? We can look at the amount of canal diameter in the cervical, lumbar, and thoracic spine based on the grade of degeneration and the position that they're in. We can look at cranial settling. We can look at the cervical medullary angle. We can look at all the parameters for atlantodense intervals. And you can see that it does change with position. So depending on the measurements that we're doing, we can get a lot of information from this. We can look at the sagittal alignment. And we see that you actually move different parts of your spine based on the alignment of your spine. And you can look at the different alignments. You can look at the amount of hyperlordosis, kyphosis, and your spine moves differently. So what we know is that your spine, based on the alignment, it doesn't always move the same at the same levels. We can look at uh, degenerative parameters. We've correlated the T1 slope with the SVAs we, for the regional cervical spine. We've published articles on sagittal balance. Spondylolisthesis is more likely to be there if you're off balance. We can look at um, the C7 angle. We can actually predict sagittal imbalance by looking at the muscles, the paraspinal tissues, and the amount of fatty infiltrate on the muscles in the paracervical area. You can actually predict and see the effect of having poor sagittal balance in the cervical spine on the musculature of, of the spine. I don't have any I don't have the time, I think I'm already over time here to go into all the details, but it's a very powerful research tool. And I think in the future, it might help us answer some questions about the degeneration of the spine. Um, again, it's, it's not gonna be just limited to the spine. I think position changes in other areas of the musculoskeletal system. And I think this technology will help us maybe understand other areas of the body. So with that, I thank you very much for your attention.